Hi, everyone. My name is Jason, um, and I'm super excited to be here today to talk about static sites and specifically how you can uh, kind of take your static sites to the next level by making them into fully dynamic apps. Um, so to start, my name is Jason Langsdorf. I'm a developer advocate at Gatsby. I uh, used to be a front-end architect at IBM. Um, I'm based in Portland, Oregon in the US. And I'm going to make a big claim. I truly believe, uh, with no hyperbole whatsoever, that you should use GraphQL for absolutely everything and serve your entire app as static assets. Um, and I'm joking, but only kind of. Because development today is different. Um, the way that we used to build things uh, was where all data came from one place. We developed on a monolithic app, and we shipped a monolithic app to our end users. But the monolithic CMS, or the monolithic way to manage data, is dying. It's changing. We're no longer seeing that anymore. So there are still monolithic CMSs, but even the major players like, uh, like Magento and WordPress and Drupal are moving to a headless model. Uh, has anybody in here used or heard of headless CMSs? We've seen a couple of them on stage today. OK, great. So um, the future is something that we're calling the content mesh. And the content mesh is this idea that in a traditional website, you had images, text, products, a search field, all of these things coming from the same monolithic CMS. But with the content mesh, you pull that data from where it makes the most sense. You have your images coming from Cloudinary. You have your search in Algolia. You're pulling your product and payment information from Stripe. You can use Contentful for the actual content, right? These are all best in class at what they do. And you don't have to shoehorn everything else into them. You just combine these different things. And so this is a really amazing advancement in development because we're able to now use the, the purpose-built tools to, to manage the data in a way that it should be managed. You don't have to find a way to force e-commerce data into WordPress or to shoehorn content management strategies into Magento. You can just use Magento for your products and use a CMS for your, your content, and they don't have to match. You're able to load your data from literally anywhere using APIs. Uh, you may have heard this called the Jamstack. It's a wonderful way to work because you're now not limited by the back end in what you can do for the front end. If, you're, if your back end team wants to use something like WordPress or Magento or Shopify or you know, GraphCMS or whatever, they can do that. And it doesn't affect what you use on the front end. You can use any front end stack you want and access that data as an API. It also allows you to build the custom UIs that combine multiple data sources. So again, like we said, you're not just relegated to one system. You can choose a multi uh, multiple systems and combine that data on the front end into a cohesive user experience, despite the fact that the content is managed in multiple different backend sources. This is also challenging. Um, and part of the reason that it's challenging is that when you introduce multiple backend APIs into a front end experience, you have atrocious performance pitfalls. You have things like making a bunch of chained responses that result in jank and judder and all sorts of problems on the front end. You also have issues where it's, you're not sure if you can run things in parallel or if they need to run synchronously. Um, if you've ever found yourself in callback hell or a, an endless promise chain or you've gotten yourself tied up in a knot trying to figure out how promise.all works, uh, you may be familiar with these problems. Complex business logic also starts showing up in the UI. You don't necessarily want your UI developers to be, handing, to be handling critical business logic, right? So you want to make sure that that's being handled somewhere else. But with this approach, with this Jamstack approach, all of that business logic shows up in the front end. So that's a, that's a big problem. Um, and because that business logic starts to show up in the front end, your UI can start to become really tightly coupled to the back end. And finally, your state management can get really nightmarish. How many people have a Redux to config that they're terrified to touch? I see a few hands. I have many of them. Um, because it just, over time, gets so complex that it's almost impossible to manage these. Um, and beyond that, just running asynchronous stuff is hard. This is a, a page load where I did not scroll the page at all. And I didn't sp uh, slow this down or speed this up. This is just what it looks like to load this website. An ad pops in, and then an image pops in, and then something else pops in, and, and you don't even know where you are on the page. Um, so this is a really, really 
unfortunate uh, loading experience. So how do we tame this content mesh? How do we get all of these benefits of this amazing new paradigm where we can pull data from wherever we want and put it into a manageable front-end development solution, into a manageable uh, content mesh solution? The first thing is to centralize your data access using GraphQL. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about the specific benefits of GraphQL today because I think everybody on stage has done a pretty good job of doing that for me. Um, because the second thing that I'm gonna talk about is a little more controversial, and that is that we should only be serving optimized static assets. I wanna remove servers from the, the consideration when you're serving a UI. You should just be building assets, putting them on uh, an S3 bucket or into cloud storage, and then putting them on a CDN, and that should be your front-end app. So to centralize your data with GraphQL, you're gonna end up with things like better explorability. If you have your, um, your products coming from something like Stripe or Shopify, and your data coming from GraphCMS or Strapi or, uh, or you know, Contentful, wherever, in GraphQL, you can link them together. Uh, you can create relationships between these data types so that you could have, for example, care instructions, uh, which are long text-based things stored in GraphCMS, and then in Shopify, you would just cross-link. So your product data is stored in Shopify, your care instructions, additional explanations, whatever, are stored in GraphCMS, and you're able to just make that a very natural relationship in GraphQL. Um, you get a single source of truth. So despite the fact that data is coming from multiple different APIs, GraphQL allows you to combine that all into a single place. You get a single source of truth. And you get a more scalable and team-friendly version of your app. Um, instead of having every front-end developer who comes into the team have to become an expert in API management, they get to come in with a single GraphQL endpoint, and then they just write JavaScript. They don't have to learn to become server management. You also get a consistent and shareable dev workflow. If you have a workflow that abstracts all of your backend data into a sing, uh, centralized GraphQL endpoint, then it doesn't matter what stack the content is coming from. Your front end team at your agency can build a consistent shared set of components and styling uh, design system, any kind of shareable components and reusable functionality that relies on a centralized GraphQL endpoint and it doesn't matter if that data comes from WordPress or GraphCMS or whatever you want. It's all coming from wherever, and it ends up in GraphQL. So you can be more consistent with your dev workflows. You're not retraining teams depending on what CMS they manage or they rely on. The other thing, going static for everything, gives you a lot of huge benefits. You get a blazing fast performance. Um, it, all other things being equal, you cannot make a server rendered page go faster than a statically rendered asset. It's just not possible. Um, and if you can make your server side go faster than a static page, it's because you've cached it and you're now serving a static asset. Um, you end up with a simpler deployment workflow. If all you're doing is building local files to a folder and uploading those to a, a CDN or to your S3 bucket, that is significantly simpler than a server-managed workflow where you have to deal with, uh, with horizontal scaling or various fallback mechanisms, cache clearing, all of these problems that happen when you're dealing with globally deployed enterprise-level node servers or servers of any sort. Um, you also get a reduced DevOps overhead. You can increase the level, the level of complexity for deploying servers because you're no longer managing servers. You're now just paying attention to whether or not your S3 bucket and your, your CDN are live. Um, not a lot of DevOps there. So you basically remove that, that level of complication. And so in Gatsby, we've kind of abstracted a lot of this away so that you have a really pleasant workflow and you don't have to think about centralizing your data, and you don't have to think about that, uh, that usage of the data, because we're doing it for you. So we have some Node APIs that allow you to take any data source at all and put it into GraphQL. So this can be another GraphQL API. It can be data from a REST API. It can be a JSON file. It can be a CSV. It can be of the file system. Anything you want, we can put it into our GraphQL API and make it accessible from a centralized place, including creating relationships between those new nodes. We early bind the data at build time. So if you've got something like a shop or a blog, that data doesn't change very often. So we'll take that data and build it ahead of time, and then we ship that to the CDN, which means that your website is no longer bound up to your server. Your server can go down, but your built site stays live. This means that you've got better uptime, 
better reliability, and most importantly, because there's no link between your static files and your server, higher security. Because if somebody hacks your CDN, all they can do is deface static files. They don't get database access. They don't get the chance to go back and mess with your actual server because there's no way to touch it. You're able to generate static assets, which I've talked about at length, and we, uh, we automate performance tuning in Gatsby. So what we're going to do in Gatsby when you build is we're going to manage your, your bundle splitting, we're going to inline render critical assets, we're gonna optimize your images, we're going to um, eliminate a lot of asynchronous calls and things that would slow you down at runtime, and a whole bunch of other things that make your site run faster so that you don't have to think about it. If you take our default starter and run it through the Lighthouse audit or webpagetest.org, we're going to get straight A's and 100 out of 100 on performance by default which means that instead of being set up in a situation where you're starting with a blank page and you have to make something fast, you're in a situation where you have the best possible solution and all you have to do is keep it there. And then once you're done, you just deploy it to a CDN and you get all those benefits. Um, but, and this is where we differ from something like Hugo or Jekyll or uh, other static site generators. Once you get to the browser, we're actually rehydrating into a React app which means that once you're in the browser, you actually have the capability of going back and doing all sorts of client-side rendering. Um, and so this gives you a lot of power, and you get all the benefits of these static assets without trading any of the flexibility of a dynamic app. So this kind of boils down to our core philosophy at Gatsby. We want to make the right thing the easy thing. Uh, the general idea here is that every tool we build, we want it to be something so that if you take every single shortcut, if you're completely under deadline, everything that is happening is going wrong and you have to do it as fast as possible, even those decisions will lead to a great outcome for the user. We want the lazy solution to be the best solution. It should be hard to make bad choices in a well-designed API. And this is a core philosophy of a lot of things that I've built, but especially in Gatsby, it's something that we really deeply care about, uh, is making sure that you don't have to learn how to be a performance expert, you just get those benefits, right? And we don't need you to become a performance expert to keep those benefits. They just happen and they just stay there as long as you agree to, to abide by the, the couple of opinions that Gatsby has as a framework. And so, one of the pushbacks that we get often is uh, people will say, well, yeah, okay, but Gatsby is a static site generator. My site has user accounts. My site has uh, authenticated routes. My site has live updating data. My site has something dynamic, right? And I want to point out something extremely important. Static assets does not mean static apps. When you serve a React app, you can make an asynchronous call to load more data, right? And that means that when we rehydrate to a React app, you get all those benefits again. React apps are dynamic, despite the fact that they're just a JavaScript file. And Gatsby sites are React apps once they get to the browser. And so that means that through the transitive property, Gatsby sites are dynamic, right? We're not taking away any functionality from you as a developer on the client side. We're just giving you a lot of benefits on the serving side. So the way that this works, to visualize it a little bit, is that all of your data sources, whether it's another GraphQL API or one of these multiple services and, and many, many more, get aggregated into Gatsby as you're developing. These come into a centralized GraphQL layer so that you're able to develop using GraphQL and React. Um, as you build with GraphQL and React, this is gonna feel very similar to, to a Create React app instance. You're going to you know, import React, write your components, you can use Redux, you can use Apollo, uh, Apollo as a, a, a client-side GraphQL library. You can make async calls, you can do literally anything you would do with a React app. Once you're done, you deploy it to static assets and put those up on a CDN of your choice, like S3 or Netlify. And finally, when it gets to the browser, it rehydrates to a React app. And at this point, you might be saying, okay, well, how do we get dynamic data back in? And it's a good question. So one of the ways that I would recommend to do it is through our Apollo, or through Apollo. So you can drop Apollo on top of Gatsby just like you would any other React app. Uh, you use an Apollo provider, you give a, an Apollo client, and you can make calls to any, anywhere that you would wanna go. Um, 
A good example of this is our swag store. So our swag store is uh, anybody who contributes to Gatsby, uh, any of our, our repos on our organization, we will invite you to become a maintainer of the Gatsby org, and we will also send you free swag. Uh, it's a way that we want to give back to our community and to encourage people who maybe wouldn't otherwise contribute to open source to get involved. Uh, our community is one of our strongest assets, and we want to make sure that we treat it with the respect that it deserves, because community and open source is absolutely everything. Um, and so the way this works under the hood is we pull in product data from Shopify. So the images, the product description, the prices, they all come in from Shopify at build time. Then we pull in Auth0 and the Shopify buy SDK on the client side. That allows us to create a shopping cart, add and remove items, uh, gives us dynamic uh, additions. And then we use Auth0 so that you can log in with your GitHub account so that we can check whether or not you've made contributions to our repo and give you the coupon code for free things. On the, uh, the back end, we have client-only routes. So you can only get to this page if you're authenticated, which means that uh, at Gatsby build time, we just put together like a little app shell, and the rest of this is, is kind of a loading screen. And then now that you're authenticated, we can go and make those asynchronous requests to load this data. So you get my username, how many contributions I've made to Gatsby, this form where I can submit and get my coupon code, and uh, some other little goodies like issues that we'd love to get some help with, what I did last. And this is done through GitHub to get this data. And so uh, this is a really hard, I, obviously I don't have, we're, we're running short on time, so I'm not gonna do the demo that I would normally do. But um, this is a, a Gatsby app put together with Apollo GraphQL for client side uh, queries. And the whole thing takes about 85 or 90 lines of code. I've cleaned it up a bit since what was here. Um, I will tweet this out and uh, just look for the, the hashtag so that you can see it, uh, because like I said, we're a little short on time, so I'm not gonna do a demo. Um, so you can see the demo here at uh, th this repo, Gatsby with Apollo. Um, I'm not gonna keep it up long, so if you wanna do, uh, do a picture. Uh, <laughs> and again, the, these slides are up at git.io slash beyond static if you would like to see them online as well. Um, and you can go ahead and get in and try this yourself at gatsbyjs.org. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at jlangsdorf down at the bottom. Um, I would love to talk to you, help you out. You can always send me a link to your repo. I'll take a look and, and help get you unstuck if you're having trouble. Um, so to reiterate, my goal here is to convince you that you should be trying to use GraphQL for everything. There are cases where GraphQL is gonna make sense, but most of those are that you have so much legacy code that the work is not worth it. In any, in any case where you're refactoring or starting new, GraphQL is, is very commonly going to be the best solution because it scales better. Um, and I want you to serve your entire app as static assets. And there are a lot of benefits for that that I haven't talked about. If you'd like to find me after, I can, uh, I can talk your ear off for, for days. Um, but for the reasons that we've talked about today, these are great reasons to treat all UIs as static assets. They should be treated as, as static assets. They should be served as static assets. This also allows you to do really cool things such as open sourcing your entire UI as a great use case of how to use your backend APIs, um, which is a great way to do developer relations and you know, show people how to use your stuff. Uh, there, and there are so many other benefits. And that's all I've got today. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Twitter.